as the supervising sound editor, um, I come on earlier than Ron. Ron is, Ron's job is to take the material that I'm going to create, all the sounds for the Blade Runner universe that you've never heard before. I have to go through a many months long process of designing and creating sound that you've never heard before. And then I give it to Ron later in the process. And his job is to take all those elements and create um, uh, a mix of that track. And I'll, uh, I'll use a metaphor. Um, my job, if you don't understand sound, is my job is more like the director of photography. I shoot all the little pieces of film. But of course, you don't shoot those pieces of film in order. It's not a finished film. Ron is more like the editor. He takes all my pieces of sound, and much like the film editor crafts what the DP gives him, Ron takes all those, that sound and turns it into an actual soundtrack, a finished, polished recording of audio. I'll give you an example. The, um, the spinners, which are which one of the uh, items we uh, reprise from the first film, the, the hovercraft that Deckard flies in, um, those are made from bull roars. You know, this is this cat of nine tails that indigenous people spin above their heads. So a lot of the work that I do when I'm designing is creating these free associations. And so I look, I look for kind of visual metaphor to find the sonic metaphor. So um, Theo Green and I, who was my co-sound designer, um, we, we started looking for textures. We wanted this kind of buzzing, spinning sound, because they were called spinners. So I'm working with something I was already given. And we had some recordings of indigenous peoples doing this All we had was that simple recording. We then had to manipulate that and turn it into the, what sounded like the engine of a, a futuristic spaceship. So you have to create sounds of it taking off, landing, flying by, inside the cockpit, steady state driving, all from one sort of little bit of, of audio. Well, tell her what you did with those rumbles and the rattling and all that, how you can, it's <laughs> so really cool. We, <laughs> D Denis w wanted to impart this idea that the spinners, because we're post blackout, this is a little bit of story business, um, every, there's no more manufacturing, there's no more spare parts for anything, so everything's in a bit of disrepair. So K, and because K is way down on the sort of totem pole in terms of hierarchy of importance at the LAPD, he got a crappy spinner. So he wanted us to sell this idea of it not working very well. So one of the things we did was we took a subwoofer, a big bass speaker, and we put it in my wife's Honda Element, an old sort of SUV kind of vehicle, and played low frequency sounds so that it vibrated the interior. And you would excite all the little parts that are loose inside the car, and you got these great rattles. So whenever you're inside the spinner, um, you hear the sound of my wife's Honda. <laughs> Not very futuristic. <laughs> but a good rattle, nonetheless. <laughs> a lot of people say, I want that louder, turn that down at 55 feet, turn this up. And you're like, oh, okay, do that. You know, and it feels that way. Denis, Micromanaged in a way. Yeah, yeah. Denis is very different. He it's would, all from the heart. He would say, in this scene, I want Kay to feel this. And we're like, oh, okay. So then it's up to us to like, all right, take these down, play more of this, shape this differently, rebalance that. Is that what you're looking for? But yeah, that's great. But it gave you great. the ability to make that decision. Right, and that's what the freedom and the creativity, that collaboration is just fantastic. I, I love working with people like that. D Denis is very distinct in that Traditionally, what we do, which is called post-production, happens after the film is shot. Denis is a very forward-thinking filmmaker in that he started sound when photography started. Um, his thinking, and this is something, this, is, this was fulfilling a childhood dream for him. He said, all my life as a filmmaker, I've wanted to have sound inform the edit. That's a very, very progressive idea. And he put his money where his mouth was and Theo Green, my design partner, started in the edit room with Joe Walker from the beginning of photography. The idea being that sound is such a critical, it's 50% of the motion picture, should inform the way the edit is created from day one. It should be constantly informing, such that by the time photography is completed, you have a rough idea of the kind of the, the movie that you have. They, you know, they're, they're obviously roughing in um, temporary music, the composer, although he's very prescient that way too. He had brought on our composer during product, during the shoot, and so all, sound and image were all informing each other to, to create the edit. That, that concept really came into fruition where there was a scene in the casino with 
Elvis and that whole part where it's all cutting in and out. That scene was almost cut out of the movie. It's one of the best scenes in the movie. And the reason it's back in, a main reason, not the only one, but it, 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 the first concept was to have it so chaotic that all of those musical elements were playing all at the same time. It was total chaos, and they were running around trying to shoot each other, and, you know, get in fight, and it was so chaotic, you lost the fight. You didn't know what it was about. So they scrapped the whole scene. It was gone. And then the, the music editor, Clint Bennett, and Theo, his partner, took it apart and started cutting things in and out and changing it up and had great dynamics of stuff. It's kind of broken. It's 30 years later. Nothing's been repaired. Same kind of idea. And it was magic because it allowed so much you know, anticipation. And you didn't know what was coming next. And it was so chaotic, but in a very dynamic way and, the, and it turned back into a chase and a fight and that's what he loved and that scene got back in the movie. Another critical relationship is between myself and the composer as well as with Ron. Definitely, yeah. So, especially on a film like this where we intentionally tried to cross borders. We wanted this to be a seamless soundtrack where you couldn't tell where score left off and sound design began and vice versa. So we have to learn to work very closely with the composer to know that we're working harmoniously. That, that's a really critical relationship. There was a lot of that going on in this film, more than anything I think I've done. Uh, and the way it was presented in well, the first place was to deliver a lot of different stems of the music, separate parts. So you would have one synth Spring part. stems. Yeah, stems are like broken out parts of an entire mix. So if you hear the whole cue, it would be the sum total of all these parts. So every track is separate. I would have one synth track, a different synth track, a low thing, a pad, and you know, all these things are separate. Then uh, we would go through and listen to them all, and they were purposely overbuilt so that we could then sculpt and change things depending on what they've got going with sound design, the sounds that Denis likes or does not like. And we would go through and pick stuff with Denis and he would say, I like that, I like that, I really like that, but not in my movie. And then we'd take that out and try this. And so I thought was, we had a plethora of great stuff to work with from Ben and Han, so you can't go wrong with that. But Denis would strip things down and make it very simplistic, and then sometimes we'd build it back up. And it, it allowed you to be able to push and pull with when sound effects came and went and marry them a lot more organically, uh, overlapping and trading off where normally you wouldn't be able to if it was all glued mm -hmm. together and you're stuck. Like, get rid of that, we're only playing this. It wasn't that way in this film at all. He knows, like most smart directors, that he, didn't, he, he gave me a cut of the film with no music in it. And he edits with Joe Walker that way because he wants to know that a scene works on its own merits before the music bumps it up to that next level. So his thought was, on this film, we could work very musically, um, very compositionally, not diegetically, meaning not put a sound because I see something on camera. He wanted us to work in these long, sweeping arcs, much more like a painting, much more like an abstract painting. And so um, Theo, who's also a composer, and I um, both had this opportunity to create um, uh, musical textures which is kind of what we extrapolated from the first movie. It's one of the successes of the first film, is that in any given scene in Deckard's apartment or in, or in um, Terrell Corporation, an environment is informed or infused with these musical sounds, but it's not melody, it's not rhythm, it's an ambience. It's a musical ambience that gives a feel to a scene. So we got to bring to bear all of our uh, uh, musical abilities in, in creating those sound compositions that. Uh, underpin almost every scene in our movie. So musical ability was very important. I think everybody on our crew is a musician, yeah. come to think of it. Byron, the dialogue editor, is a guitar player. My partner, Doug, another guitar player. Everybody's a guitar, guitar player. player. Drummer. Drummer. <laughs> the lone percussionist. <laughs> but that came in handy. <laughs> yeah. We, there was a scene, uh, the Vegas walk, we call it, when the, he's walking through the Red Desert. Uh, going to the bees and then the casino. If we back up before that, we were mixing away and Mark called me at night and says, the legal department called and says, we can't use anything from the original Blade Runner. So we had spinner sounds, we had these giant drum hits, you know, the big boom, you know, the, and we had to take all those out. 
So he says, can you re-record some of those at home tonight? I have a home studio in 7-1. And I was like, sure, I'd love to. So I got out all my drums. I'm banging all these drums till 3 in the morning. My wife loves that part. And uh, <laughs> mixed the whole thing and brought them into the studio the next morning. And remastered them all. And then uh, we start placing them throughout the film. And we put some in that scene as well. Well, there's a huge music cue that goes through the whole thing. It was always planned that way. And they wrote a beautiful cue. Denise started stripping it out, saying, what if we make it less and more minimalistic and uh, take that out, take that out. I got to the end, I'm like, Denise, all I have left are the drum hits. He goes, play it. And we hit play and we all sat back and we're like, whoa. <laughs> it was so cool because it was so dynamic and so anticipatory, like what's going to happen? He's, where's he going? And it was just really dramatic. And so we kept it. And that's how that ended up like that. Uh, there, throughout the whole film, it's the first sound you hear in the movie. So mm -hmm. I was very proud of that and uh, just loved the sound of like this huge drum down to like Nothing. barely any wind and just a few footsteps. I'm particularly proud of that sequence because from the time Cabe walks in the desert till he meets Deckard, it's a 12 minute stretch of cinema with no dialogue and no music. Right. Almost unheard of in cinema. And that's, that's a sign of sort of Denis' bravery in his filmmaking that he thought the, the imagery and the sound could, could carry the weight of the film without exposition or music. He inherently understands that when an audience enters a movie theater, part of our job is to what they call suspend disbelief. We know a movie is an artifice, and it's the filmmaker's job to create a, a world, to, to invite you into a world and get you to sign off on it, to believe in it. So part of the success of that weaving of sound and music and having you wonder which was which is that subconsciously we saw it as one soundtrack. It's, you know, soundtrack, you hear that term, soundtrack is the, you buy it at the, uh, you know, at the store, that's the music of the movie, but sound is all the sound that you hear. And we tried to create something that was much more seamless than that, such that the audience would never be thinking, ah, music cue, ah, sound effect. We just wanted sound. This is the sound of the Blade Runner universe. I thought it was very successful for us in creating something you'd never experienced before.